Hello everyone. In this recording, we are going to discuss what is known as job costing. Okay, now with when we actually assign costs to our manufacturing process. So once again, those would be materials, labor and overhead costs. All right? And so when we're on a manufacturing line and we're assigning these costs to our inventory, there are a couple of ways to do that. And it really depends on the type of process. In this chapter, it's called job costing. The main idea with job costing is each job or each customer order is unique. They are not the same exact items that we are producing for every single customer. So a good example would be, say, if you are a home builder and you are building individual homes for individual homeowners. Now, the the model might be different, the kitchen cabinets might be different, the, the flooring might be different. Um, so certainly the different options that are chosen. Basically put, each home site is a separate job and the job costs would flow appropriately. Now let's compare that to a future chapter where we talk about something called process costing. Process costing is when the, when the inventory we are producing, manufacturing, are exactly the same. A good example I can give you would be, let's say, Colgate making tubes of toothpaste. The tube of toothpaste that I buy at the store is going to be the same exact tube of toothpaste that you buy at the store. Therefore, the process is basically the cost that go into each inventory item is exactly the same. We will study that in the next chapter. But right now, we're going to concentrate on job costing. So let's just review what we talked about in prior chapters, um, these, these concepts. First, cost object. Basically, anything we're trying to measure a cost for. So a good example of a cost object would be uh, a, a, an inventory item, all right? And that's exactly what we're going to get at in this particular chapter. A direct cost are basically those costs that we can directly trace to that particular item. As an example, direct materials. We know exactly which materials went to each product. Or direct labor, that would be the assembly line workers. We know exactly which items they were working on. Uh, versus an indirect cost, an indirect cost where there needs to be some sort of allocation method to assign cost to a particular item. Usually the indirect costs are overhead items. As an example, the electricity bill for the manufacturing plant, the tax bill, the rent bill, um, the custodial staff, the kitchen staff, the maintenance staff. Um, you get it, right? These are these are costs, obviously, that are necessary uh, to run the manufacturing plant. But it is very difficult to see a direct line between these costs and the actual inventory items. So we will come up with an allocation method in order to assign those costs to each item that we are producing. All right, a cost pool is basically, as you can imagine, the word pool. We are basically going to gather all of our costs uh, together. Uh, and this is really important for the indirect costs, where if we gather all of our costs together and then use one large allocation method to allocate the indirect costs to the individual inventory items. All right, and then in order to allocate, we need to come up with a cost allocation base. Is basically our allocation methodology to allocate the indirect costs to the inventory items. And we will be studying that as we go along in this particular chapter. Okay, like I said earlier, job costing system is what we're studying now. Each unit that we are producing is unique. With process costing, the items that we are producing are very much identical and the accounting is a little bit different and we will study that in process costing in the next chapter. This chapter, we're going to talk all about job costing. Okay, here are some examples and I really want to zone in on the right hand column considering we are concentrating on manufacturing in this course, but you can see this is also, alloc this is also 
applicable to uh, service companies as well as merchandising companies as well. So with job costing, I gave the example of a home builder, but you can see some examples here. Assembly of an individual aircraft, all right? Every aircraft that Boeing makes is unique. So certainly, or construction of a ship, all right? Every ship is different. So certainly job costing would be best for that. Process costing, when the inventory items that we are manufacturing are pretty much exactly the same. This is a good example here. I gave the toothpaste example, but here's an example. I'm circling with my cursor. The, uh, the, the, the soda produ or beverages produced by PepsiCo. Perfect example, right? My can of uh, Pepsi Cola is the same as yours. Okay, now when we go through job costing, in order to allocate indirect costs, you forget about direct costs because that's pretty easy, and I'll show you that in a minute. It's really when we allocate indirect costs. We need to allocate based on either actual indirect costs or budgeted indirect costs. Now, I will be honest with you. Most companies, what they do is they allocate based on the budget. And then what they do is they review at the end of the year, they review what they allocated versus the actual costs. And then they will adjust at year end the difference between budget versus actual. Sometimes we allocated too much, meaning the budget was higher than the actual. Sometimes we allocated too little because the actual numbers came in higher than the budget. Well, we will adjust for that at the end of the year. The reason why normal costing, and this is when we use the budgeted costs for allocation, is used predominantly is because a lot of times the actual indirect costs are not known until months after the production takes place. As an example, I can be producing in you know the beginning of uh, March, let's say. There might be some costs that I may not know until later in the year like the actual taxes for the building. You know, that is, it could take months and months and months to figure out actual costs. So a lot of times, just for accounting purposes, we want to kind of keep up and we will use the budgeted numbers and then we will adjust later in the year to the actual. Okay, um, and like I said, so that is normal costing when budgeted numbers are used to allocate the indirect cost. If you see the top of this slide with the direct costs, and once again, the direct costs are the direct materials and the direct labor, it doesn't matter because they are known pretty much right away. So the actual costs are used when we assign them to inventory items. It's just in the indirect cost, which is pretty much the overhead where we would use the budgeted numbers for normal costing. And once again, most companies, as I mentioned, are going to use normal costing for that. Okay, there is uh, a process that we are going to use when we go through job costing. Um, first, we have to identify the job, basically. All right, um, we're going to identify the direct costs. That's easy, the direct materials and the direct labor. We pretty much know the materials as they're requisitioned from the... Uh, the inventory room onto the assembly line as they are requisitioned. That will be our uh, process for knowing which costs for direct materials are assigned to each job. When our employees fill out time cards for the day, um, we know exactly which jobs they were working on, so we can use the time cards for the direct labor. It pretty much helps us with number two. And then we get into the indirect cost, and that's when number three steps in and, and so on and so forth. With number three, we are going to select a cost allocation base so we can allocate the indirect cost. Let me give you an example. Maybe the base is the number of hours that the employees are working, and we can base our indirect method per direct labor hour, or maybe per machine hour, like the machines are working for so long. So we will take, you know, consolidate all of our overhead costs, and we will just divide them by the number of machine hours that were used and figure out what's the overhead per machine hour. These are examples, and I will show you that as we go through this. All right, and so, of course, we need to identify all the indirect costs. I gave you some examples, 
we've got the maintenance, we've got the janitorial, we've got the taxes, we've got the rent, we've got the electricity, um, we've got uh, security, possibly, uh, anything associated with the manufacturing plant that aren't that it's very difficult to directly relate to each individual job, each individual inventory item that's being manufactured. Even the indirect materials, and you know, most materials in labor are direct, but there are some indirect materials in indirect labor. As an example, the supervisor of the manufacturing plant. That supervisor is not actively working on the assembly line. So if that is the case, which I'm sure is the case most of the time, his or her salary is going to be considered an indirect labor, all right? And so cost can be indirect as well for materials and labor. And then we're going to figure out the rate per unit using our cost allocation method. All right, and so we have an example here for an overhead rate. Here's an example. It would equal the budgeted overhead cost in total. So we're going to come up with a budget number for all of our overhead and divide it by our cost allocation base. And like I said, the cost allocation base could be the number of labor hours, number of machine hours. Those are pretty standard. All right. And then, of course, we will take the allocation rate, multiply it by the actual activity for that particular job. So as an example, I mean, I'm just throwing numbers out here so you have an idea. Let's say I go through the step five and I calculate that um, total overhead for the period is budgeted at a million dollars and budgeted um, um, total quantity cost allocation base. Let's say we are budgeting for 100,000 direct labor hours. So if I take a million divided by 100,000, that works out to 10. So the overhead rate would be 10. So if I actually worked, let's go to number six. If I said this particular job took um, three hours, we would take the three labor hours times my rate, which is 10. So I would allocate three times 10 or $30 of overhead for that particular job. I know that was a mouthful. So for those of you that might want to stop me here and rewind me and listen to that a couple of times, Hopefully you will understand that. Okay, now the journal entries. There are not many times in this course where we go through a lot of journal entries, except when it comes to, obviously, the inventory process. So we're going to be talking about inventory journal entries a lot in this course, but besides that, not a lot of other types of journal entries. So once again, there are three types of costs that are allocated to each job. And those are, once again, number one, direct materials. Number two, direct labor. Number three, overhead. And the overhead is going to be including all of your indirect costs. Indirect costs could also include indirect materials and labor. Those are the three types of manufacturing costs. One, direct materials, two, direct labor, three overhead which is including all the indirect costs okay um let me show you how costs flow through the financial statements here i'm just showing it to you in picture format and then on a future slide i'm going to show you it with the actual numbers and hopefully you will understand you know once i go through the numbers as well so the manufacturing costs, also known as the inventoriable costs. Once again, and I know I sound like a broken record to a bunch of you, but it is good that you keep hearing it. The three types of inventoriable costs are direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. The light blue box, materials, direct materials, direct labor, and the darker blue box is the overhead. And once again, the overhead is going to include indirect materials and indirect labor. Okay, so on the balance sheet, um, what's gonna happen is this. We're going to have our first, um, we have, we're gonna have three inventory accounts. Our first inventory account is going to be called raw materials. And so when we buy these materials, we will initially debit the raw materials account. 
Now what happens is the assembly line process starts. And so what happens is some of the raw materials are requisitioned to the assembly line. They're basically called to the assembly line. And so what happens is there is a journal entry to reduce the direct materials inventory account with a credit. And those direct materials, as they are assigned to the assembly line, you're going to see it's going to go to the WIP process, work in process. The WIP inventory is the second inventory asset account on the balance sheet. All right. And so once we, uh, once we bring the direct materials over to the WIP, also on the WIP, we are going to add, this is when we add the direct labor, and those are obviously from the payroll records, and we are also going to add our overhead, and we will do that using an allocation method. Do you see here I'm circling this word allocated? We're not going to use the actual overhead once again. The actual overhead may not be known for many months, so we're going to allocate it used based on our predetermined um, allocation rate. And so this work in process works through the assembly line where we've got the materials and the labor and the overhead. Once an item is finished, we are going to move the item out of the WIP inventory into our third inventory account on the balance sheet. And that is called finished goods inventory. Our inventory will remain in finished goods until we sell it. When we sell it, it comes off of the balance sheet out of the inventory account and it goes on to the income statement into the cost of goods sold account. This last two step, which I'm circling here, it finished goods being sold, and then it goes to the cost of goods sold. This is what you learned in principles class, principles one. All right. But because we're dealing with the manufacturing plant, uh, we have this these steps up here up front with the materials, labor, and overhead being converted into the WIP process. Now down here at the bottom, we have not our inventoriable or our manufacturing costs, but something called period costs. Period costs, you can see this is all blank here. It's all white space. That's because period costs completely bypass the balance sheet. They go automatically to the income statement as selling general and administrative expenses. You can see some examples here. We've got marketing expenses and other types of expenses. All right, and so journal entries are made in every single step of that process that I showed you, okay? And um, once again, when we are buying direct materials and then we are requisitioning direct materials onto the assembly line, and it gets added to the WIP inventory, and that is where we will also add the direct labor and we will allocate the overhead. Okay, so the actual journal entries themselves. I've mentioned it a few times, but now we're actually seeing it on the screen, the debits and the credits. So typically journal entry one, we buy raw materials. And raw materials could be direct and indirect, but we're gonna have our first inventory account called materials control. You can see that there it's being debited. And we're either crediting accounts payable or cash, however we're paying for it. Now, when the, um, assembly line process is starting and the materials are being requisitioned onto the assembly line, what's going to happen is the materials inventory account is going to be credited. And we are going to debit the WIP inventory. This is the second inventory account for the direct materials. The indirect materials are going to go to this account called overhead. So the debits to the overhead account are the actuals. The debits to the overhead account are the actuals. Keep that in mind. And this overhead account, you might be asking, well, what type of account is that? Is it an asset? Is it an expense? The answer is really none of the above. This overhead account is only used during the year, but at the end of the year when we prepare financial statements, this overhead account we're going to make sure has a zero balance. And I will show you that as we go along. Okay, now the materials were requisitioned to the assembly line. Now we're going to add labor and we're going to add um, all of our, well, this is adding labor. Okay, so the actual payroll, 
is both direct and indirect. So when we pay payroll, of course, we're going to credit cash so our employees can get paid. But instead of debiting payroll expense, which would be the normal service company debit here, because this is a manufacturing plant, instead of debiting payroll expense, we're going to debit the WIP inventory. This is an asset, the WIP inventory, for the direct labor. These are the assembly line workers. And then we will debit this overhead account for the indirect labor, just like we debited overhead for the indirect materials. Indirect labor, once again, an example of that would be like the supervisor of the manufacturing plant. Okay, and then of course we have all our other overhead items like the FPL bill, like the water bill, like the security bill, like the tax bill, like the rent bill, like the maintenance, like the janitorial staff, the kitchen staff, you name it. Whatever is going into the manufacturing uh, plant, we are going to, like I said, the actuals will be debited to the overhead account. We'll credit cash ultimately. Oh, depreciation is another one. So. If we have depreciation expense for the manufacturing plant, that will also be debited here. But the credit doesn't go to cash. The credit would go to accumulated depreciation. Okay, now this next step is important. Based on the predetermined overhead rate that we are going to decide on, we will allocate or apply, and your textbook might use the word apply, allocate or apply the actual overhead to the WIP account. So remember, this overhead account, we were debiting it for the actual costs. And when we apply it or allocate it to the actual WIP inventory account, we will credit it. And the debit goes to the WIP account. Okay. And then when we finish, the assembly line is done. The WIP inventory is going to be decreased with a credit. And then we debit our third and final inventory asset account, finished goods. And then we sell our finished goods. This should be familiar to you from principles one class. We debit cost of goods sold, which remember that's just the expense for the inventory on the income statement. And then we credit the actual inventory asset account. And then here are examples of period costs once again. The period costs are the general and administrative costs that just completely bypass the inventory on the balance sheet and they go directly to an expense account, credit cash. And when we sell the products, not only do we need to debit the cost of goods sold in credit inventory, as you remember from principles one class, we have to record the sale with a credit and we either debit cash or accounts receivable if we sold to customers on credit. So you can see lots of great journal entries to take you through the uh, job costing process. This is one of my favorite slides in this particular um, chapter where you can, you can flow through. Oh, let me go back. We can flow through using actual dollar amounts so you can see how this works. So once again, this little number one here, we are actually purchasing raw materials. Those would be direct and indirect. And by the way, when I say indirect materials, I'm talking about like oils and lubricants and things like nuts and bolts that obviously you're not going to keep track of every single uh, drop of liquid or, or nut and bolt or whatnot for each item. Those are the indirect materials. And the other materials are direct, like you know, the, 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 if we're making an automobile, the glass, the, the metal, the tires, the radio, the engine, things like that. Okay, so when we buy materials, direct materials would be debited. Uh, I'm sorry, the raw materials account would be debited and we'd most likely credit the accounts payable, which we have here, crediting the accounts payable, I'm circling it. Number two, materials were requisitioned onto the assembly line. Direct materials were 81,000 and indirect were 4,000. And so the overhead um, account, we will debit for the indirect materials of 4,000 and their direct materials of 81 go to the second inventory account called WIP, work in process. Number three, direct labor of 39,000 and indirect labor of 15,000. Okay, so 
we have the direct labor, 39,000 is going to go to the WIP account, 39,000, you see it here. The indirect labor, 15,000, is going to go to the overhead account, 15,000. Number four, other overhead items, 75,000. We'll debit the overhead, 75. All right, and the credit goes to, um, the credit is going to go to cash. Here it is. I forgot, um, I keep forgetting the, the, the credit side. There's the cash. All right. Um, okay, number five. With number five, what we're doing is, yes, we've accumulated, what, uh, $94,000 in actual overhead, but based on our allocation method, we were able to allocate $80,000 of this overhead to the WIP account. Once again, using your predetermined overhead rates. And so we would credit the overhead. Do you see this T account here? Manufacturing overhead control and the overhead allocated. This is really the one and the same. It's just showing you the debit side over here and the credit side over here. But we will credit the overhead account and the debit goes to WIP. Number six, we have made the determination that $188,800 of costs on the assembly line have been finished and they are ready to get transferred to the finished goods account. So we will debit finished goods and credit the WIP. You can follow the arrows here. And then ultimately $180,000 of inventory was sold. So we credit the finished goods and the debit goes to the cost of goods sold account. Down here, number eight, these are the period costs that go directly to the expense accounts. They don't flow through the inventory items that we had up here. And then of course, lastly, the sale price to the customers, 270,000, where we credit the revenue and the debit goes to accounts receivable. All right, so this is a nice pictorial of the flow of costs and the debits and credits. Um, obviously, I showed you the, the debit credit analysis. This is more along the lines of the T-account analysis, but it's very good that you follow these nine journal entries, and you can see the debit and credit side of, uh, of the one through nine journal entries. I did a pretty good job trying to show you the bulk of, uh, or explain the bulk of these journal entries. Hopefully, you can follow that. Now, what is the backup to these journal entries? Well, like I said, with the with the materials as they're requisitioned, um, this is an example of a, of a requisition. And you can see we're keeping track of the dates, the requisition numbers, and what was requisitioned. So this is a good way to flow through, and you can see the, the totals here for the month, of what was actually requisitioned um, for each particular job. For labor hours, you can keep track by looking at... Um, uh, time cards, and this is an example of a time card. And then, of course, we might want to have some sort of spreadsheet for all of our other overhead items. All right, so these are good backup subsidiary ledgers, if you will, for materials, labor, and overhead backup for the journal entries that we showed you earlier. Okay, like I said, overhead, um, we will debit the overhead account for the actuals. We will credit the overhead account when we allocate to the WIP account, when we allocate to the actual inventory account. All right. Uh, the interesting thing is at the end of the day, we might have either over or under allocated. So if the actual side, the debit side of the overhead account is greater than the credit side, which is the allocated side, we under allocated. And if the allocated side, the credit side of the account is greater than the debit side, we over allocated. So at the end of the year, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the over and over or under allocated overhead. And we will do that using one of these three approaches. We will either adjust the allocate a allocation rate, or we will prorate it, or we can just simply write it off to cost of goods sold. Now, it really just depends on really the materiality of the over or under applied overhead. Um, the write-off approach, that's when we have a Im very immaterial over or under applied. We're just simply going to debit, you know, get rid of the, the over or under applied by debiting or crediting the overhead account to zero it out. And the other side will be the debit or credit, whatever is necessary to the cost of goods sold. That's, step, that's actually 
choice three here on this list. Or number two, number two is when the over or under applied is a little bit more material. And so if it's a little bit more material, what we will do is we will prorate it between cost of goods sold, work in process, and finished goods. So we're saying, all right, we're making some inventory. So the costs are either still on the assembly line in the whip inventory, or they're done and they're, fi they're sitting in the finished goods inventory, or they're actually sold already. And so we have cost of goods sold. So we would actually prorate the over or under applied to cost of goods sold, whip, and finished goods inventory. Or number one is we just go back and we say, oh, we were wrong with our, our predetermined rate. Let's recalculate everything using the actual rate. That's a lot of work. I don't see a lot of uh, companies actually using step one, but certainly step two and step three um, are used more predominantly. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about job costing in manufacturing because really – we're concentrating on understanding the flow of costs in this class using a manufacturing sector. But I always want to remind students that this could also be allocated or also be also be used using the service sector or even, you know, um, selling finished goods and we're just a merchandiser. Uh, example, accounting firm. And some of you may move on to be CPAs one day. I hope you I hope you are. And you may be working for an accounting firm. When you work for an accounting firm, you are going to be working for a particular job. As a matter of fact, you might be on one of the audits of clients or doing tax returns or consulting work for one of the clients in the actual firm. Well, we have to account for not only your labor costs, but the overhead costs. Yes, there's probably not a lot of material costs that need to be allocated to the each audit job as an example, but certainly labor and certainly, and that includes direct labor and indirect labor as well as the other overhead items. So it can be used in the other sectors as well besides manufacturing. Um, 